Welcome to the 16th annual kickoff event for One Book, One Region. I'm Betty M. Ryder, director of the Groton Public Library and a founding member of the One Book Committee. I am proud to be celebrating 16 years of connecting public libraries with high school and college students, book clubs, and interested readers around the region, all through the power of reading just one book. One Book, One Region would not exist without our generous sponsors. The Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut has been an early and enthusiastic sponsor of this year's Community Read. We are grateful for their support. Start Fresh New London is partnering with us for programs, connections, advice, and food. I, I hope most of you have had a taste of that. If you haven't yet tasted their offerings, or even if you have, we invite you to please join us at the end of the program to have another uh, round. <laughs> for those of you who are not familiar with Start Fresh, they are a nonprofit organization helping refugee families contribute to the vitality of our local communities with volunteers working in small teams to meet family needs. Their monthly dinners are very popular and I understand they're going to have some uh, version of them this summer, so watch for their summer schedule. We've also been working with IRIS, Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services, a Connecticut-based group that provides a wide array of services to new Americans by providing support during their transition to life in the United States. You may have noticed two photos on display uh, as you walked in tonight. Um, and I invite you to please come by the library during the month of July, where we will have the entire uh, photo exhibit on display. 2018 marks the third year of our partnership with Connecticut College. One Book, One Region is stronger because of this connection. Their team, um, Jefferson Singer, Kim Sanchez, Tracy Reiser, Emily Morash, Deb McDonald, to name just a few, are eager partners who are not only deeply interested in introducing the chosen book to their first year students, but are also interested in connecting their students to the local community through the One Book program. This year, the selection committee had several strong contenders, but in the end, Exit West by Mohsen Hamid was an easy choice. The novel follows two young people, Nadia and Saeed, who leave their unnamed country in the midst of a civil war in the effort to invent a new life. The story of Exit West could have been taken from today's headlines, but the way it unfolds is memorable, and I hope you enjoy it. Looking back over my remarks for the last uh, few kickoff events, it seems that I usually remind you of our past one book choices and the topics that we've explored. This year, though, it seemed appropriate to remind you that our one book program has some t uh, ties to refugees and immigrants. And I'd like to take a moment to refresh your memory of, of at least two of our um, personal stories that we uh, connected through. Um, I know many of you remember our 2004 author, Haled Hosseini, author of The Kite Runner. Haled came to the United States with his family in 1980, seeking asylum during the Soviet-Afghan War. He is now a goodwill amb ambassador for the UNHCR, the United Nations Refugee Agency, and he's written eloquently about the Syrian refugee crisis. And uh, watch, he has a book coming out uh, this fall on the topic, so watch for that. We should also remember Raina Grande, author of the 2007 novel, Across a Hundred Mountains. Her award-winning memoir, The Distance Between Us, explores the story of her life before and after illegally immigrating from Mexico to the U.S. So just two of the many immigrants whose stories have enriched our lives. I hope you'll come to the library this summer to learn more about refugees and immigration. We have a great lineup of programs, and uh, we're, we'll be waiting for you to come on Tuesday nights all summer. We would not be here this evening without the support of Connecticut College, and it is my pleasure to introduce Jefferson Singer to talk about our collaboration. Jefferson is the Connecticut College Falk Foundation Professor of Psychology and Dean of the College. He completed his undergraduate work at Amherst College, earned his PhD at Yale. He's also a great supporter of One Book, One Region, and has been instrumental in bringing this program to the campus. So, Jefferson. I also have been showing off my door holding skills tonight. Yeah, so. <laughs> we are so uh, glad to have this third uh, year of collaboration with One Book, One Region. It, it is a true joy for us to, to do this. And um, Betty Ann has already mentioned uh, 
uh, Emily Marash, our first year dean, and uh, Kim Sanchez, our uh, director of community partnerships, and Tracy Rise, our former director of community partnerships, um, who have been instrumental in helping us uh, get this partnership going and continuing it now for this year. I just want to, I, I'm not going to talk about Exit West because we are, our, our featured speaker is going to get into that. I want to talk a little bit about the concept of our partnership with One Book, One Region and what that means for Connecticut College. And what I want to say is we think of reading as a solitary activity often. We think about it as something that you, you go and find a, a nook somewhere or you find a good tree with shade and you read and you engross and enter into that world of, of that book. And, um, and that is true, but the essence of what we're doing here in this room is that reading is also a partnership. It's also about reading and then saying, you know what I've read or what I've learned, can I share it with you? And there's a, a wonderful quote from uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald that I wanted to share with you. Um, <clears throat> he says, that is the part of the beauty of all literature. You discover that your longings are universal longings, that you're not lonely and isolated from everyone. You are not alone. And I think this partnership is really an expression of exactly those ideas, that reading is something that perhaps done individually, but then brings us together. And we have found in the last three years that Connecticut College, by partnering with One Book, One Region, has felt more part of the community of this region, this county, uh, of the various towns. We felt more connected um, and engaged with each other in the discussion of the books. So Just Mercy by uh, Brian Stevenson and then Homegoing by Yah Jesse. These books were books that took us to a place of, of dialogue with each other and, and helped us to think about um, ways that Connecticut College can reach beyond its uh, campus on the hill and, and find its way into the activities and partnerships of, of the community. And we also see that by having events at our campus that we, where we've featured the authors, we've found ways to bring um, all of you citizens of, of the county to our college and, and we welcome you to enjoy um, the space up there, enjoy the Arboretum, the library, and, and, and visit with us. So books can be uh, individual activities, but what we're about here is building a community. And that's the last point I want to leave you with is that this is a time right now in our world, and, and I think the book of course expresses this, where there is the potential for great isolation, the potential for great fragmentation. And reading as a collective activity, reading as a partnership is a way to cross those bridges and build relationships. And that's what this activity is about and it's what One Book, One Region inspires. And we're so glad to be partners with them in, in that enterprise. So I won't take up any more time, but um, I'll bring Tracy Reiser up or you're gonna come back up. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Um, well, I wish, and I know all of you wish, that we could have had Mosin Hamid here tonight to uh, meet you all, but it seemed a little much to have him come from Lahore, Pakistan for a two-hour <laughs> cocktail party. So instead, we have a little film clip that we want to show you, just so you get a feel for him. And we want to thank uh, the, the well-known Washington, D.C. bookstore, Politics and Prose, for allowing us to use this little clip uh, from their interview with him. This is the beginning of Exit West. <clears throat> In a city swollen by refugees but still mostly at peace, or at least not yet openly at war, a young man met a young woman in a classroom and did not speak to her for many days. His name was Said and her name was Nadia and he had a beard. Not a full beard, more a studiously maintained stubble. And she was always clad from the tips of her toes to the bottom of her jugular notch in a flowing black robe. Back then, people continued to enjoy the wearing, the luxury of wearing more or less what they wanted to wear, clothing and hair-wise, within certain bounds, of course. And so these choices meant something. It might seem odd that in cities teetering at the edge of the abyss, young people still go to class, in this case an evening class on corporate identity and product branding. But that is the way of things, with cities as with life. For one moment we are pottering about our errands as usual, and the next we are dying. And our, imp and our eternally impending ending does not put a stop to our transient beginnings and middles until the instant when it does. Said noticed that Nadia had a beauty mark on her neck, 
a tawny oval that sometimes, rarely but not never, moved with her pulse. Not long after noticing this, Said spoke to Nadia for the first time. Their city had yet to experience any major fighting, just some shootings and the odd car bombing, felt in one's chest cavity as a subsonic vibration like those emitted by large loudspeakers at music concerts. And Said and Nadia had packed up their books and were leaving class. In the stairwell, he turned to her and said, Listen, would you like to have a coffee? And after a brief pause added to make it seem less forward, given her conservative attire, in the cafeteria. <laughs> Nadia looked him in the eye. You don't say your evening prayers? she asked. Said conjured up his most endearing grin. Not always, sadly. Her expression did not change. So he persevered, clinging to his grin with the mounting desperation of a doomed rock climber. I think it's personal. Each of us has his own way, or her own way. Nobody's perfect, and in any case, she interrupted him. I don't pray, she said. <laughs> she continued to gaze at him steadily. Then she said, maybe another time. He watched as she walked out to the student parking area, and there, instead of covering her head with a black cloth, as he expected, she donned a black motorcycle helmet that had been locked to a scuffed-up 100-cc trail bike, snapped down the visor, straddled her ride, and rode off, disappearing with a controlled rumble into the gathering dusk. And that's how they meet. And, you know, uh, Sayyid and Nadia are two quite different people. Uh, he works for a small advertising firm. She works for an insurance company. Uh, uh, he is very attached to his family, to his parents. He lives at home with them. Uh, she has left her family and has moved out on her own, which is unusual for young unmarried women in the city where she lives. Um, he has an attitude towards spirituality, which is um, uh, he thinks of, of his religious practice as a spiritual practice and it's meaningful to him in his daily life. She's not particularly religious. And, um, and so these two slightly mismatched people meet each other in a city where things begin to fall apart. And uh, <coughs> in a way, the idea for the city, or the starting point of the city, um, for me, the template for that city was the city of Lahore, where I live. But, uh, but the circumstances that, uh, that, that occur in the city are, fortunately, thank goodness, um, not the circumstances of Lahore, but are more like the circumstances that have befallen Aleppo or Mosul, where extremists have come in, and uh, violence has increased, and a civil war has begun. And, and the basic elements of, of modern contemporary life start to fall away. So say that Nadia go on their first date to a Chinese restaurant, they communicate by phone, they're, you know, WhatsApping and Facebooking and, uh, you know, Instagramming or whatever, social mediaing each other. Um, they, uh, uh, he has a car and she has a motorcycle and um, they dabble in uh, marijuana and the occasional hallucinogen. And, uh, you know, typical, you know, life in the big city. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, and yet this modernity, because increasingly the large cities of the world, modern life is becoming more similar in those cities. Lahore, if I'd come to D.C. 40 or 50 years ago, I would have thought, my goodness, D.C. is so advanced, and Lahore, you know, they're just different planets. But today, uh, it's not, the gap is not quite so big. Um, Lahore also has wonderful bookshops like this one. Lahore also has art galleries and uh, advertising firms and insurance companies and mobile phone networks and uh, drug dealers and you know um, parties and uh, Chinese restaurants and uh, tall buildings and a public transport system uh, fiber optic internet um, so there's been a kind of convergence of modernity in the big cities of the world and yet that veneer is very thin and it can start to uh, be stripped away very easily. And I think part of the anxiety many people in America feel at this moment is the sudden realization of, of how thin the veneer of, of you know, civilized discourse and civilized behavior really is. Um, it's thin everywhere. So I hope that whetted your appetite and you'll be looking forward to coming to hear more from him in, in September. Um, but right now, uh, Tracy Reiser may have retired from Connecticut College, but she was not able to leave the One Book Committee, and we are very happy that she couldn't. So, Tracy. Thank you, Betty Ann. It really brings me joy to be gathered together to celebrate our love of books, the art of writing, and the willingness 
to explore complex and challenging issues in a civil, respectful manner. Thank you for coming through the door, stepping into this room, and building community together. It is my distinct honor to introduce this evening's presenter, Bina Nepram. Ms. Nepram was born in the state of Manipur in India's northeast region. She is a writer humanitarian, spearheading work on women, peace, and security issues. She is the author of five books. Her fifth edited volume, Where Are Women in Decision Making, was released in New Delhi. She is currently working on her sixth book, which looks at gender and race relations. In 2004, Ms. Nipram co-founded India's first civil society organization, the Control Arms Foundation, to work on conventional disarmament issues. In 2007, in order to help thousands of women who are affected by gun violence in her home state of Manipur, Ms. Nipram launched the Manipur Women Gun Survivor Network. She has represented Indian civil society in various women and disarmament meetings held at the United Nations in New York and in Geneva. Ms. Nepron is the recipient of the Dalai Lama Foundation's Wiscomp Scholar of Peace Award, the Sean McBride Peace Prize, CNN Real Heroes Award, and her team, Manipur Women Gun Survivors Network, won the Indian of the Year Award in the Special Achievement category. The London-based organization Action on Armed Violence named her as one of the 100 most influential people in the world working on armed violence reduction. In January 2015, Forbes listed her in 24 Young Minds of India That Matter, and India's largest circulated feminine, feminina Women's Magazine honored her with the Feminine Award, Women's Award, followed by the Young Women Federation of India Commerce and Industries Young Women Achiever Award for her work with 20,000 women survivors. In 2016, she received the Women Have Wings Award. In addition, she was honored with the Delhi University Jajabai Women Empowerment Award and the Telegraph Excellence Award in 2017. Ms. Nipron came to Connecticut College as a scholar in residence in 2018. Please join me in extending a very, very warm welcome to the esteemed Bina Nepron. Thank you so much, Tracy, and thank you to Groton, all the people of uh, Connecticut College um, who have made this possible. It's an honor to be here in this submarine capital of the world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a few weeks back, Professor Jefferson <laughs> emailed me saying he wants to have a meeting with me, and I went to his office and. He showed me that book, Exit West. Honestly, I have written books, but I've never commented on someone else's book. <laughs> so I was a little curious, um, but I knew that he had a mission for me. <laughs> and um, I delightfully took the book and started exploring. And um, it was a real, real honor to sort of uh, you know, read a free book. <laughs> I'll return it back to you, no worries. <laughs> Uh, so and so, thank you so much um, to the incredible work of One Book, One Region, uh, 16th annual kickoff event today. It's an honor to be here in this August gathering and to be able to um, speak a few words on this particular book and also at the same time um, to also share some of my thoughts on this book and also the experiences of what the world currently is. So. Um, what I, earlier I thought I will comment on the book, but I realized 
that if I start commenting, you may not read the book <laughs> because you'll know the plot and Google has the plot already. So what I thought was this morning, I thought I will share, um, I will divide my small presentation in three parts, share with you a little context where the book came from because the book is about immigration and refugees. We are living at the times when children are snatched from their parents. We are living at the time of 66 million displaced people. Um, and uh, we are living at the time where a lot of mistrust on the refugees or othering is happening into this world. So I thought we should uh, take a moment to look into for a few minutes on that. And secondly, um, with whatever Tracy spoke about me, is true. But what is also true is the fact that um, I am one of those statistics now because of our work. We live at a time when, when you are doing the right thing into this world. You are a threat to your communities and nation because you're asking for rule of law. You're asking for rights of uh, people to be respected. We are, you're asking for um, the fact that uh, women should be safe in our nations, in our communities. For f doing the right thing, we are living in a time where it's not just about Afghanistan or Pakistan, where Hamid comes from. And I had my office in Delhi, and Delhi is just two and a half hours drive from Lahore. <laughs> People used to go be before partition times to watch, have uh, breakfast in Delhi, watch a movie over lunch in Lahore, and drive back. So um, to be able to juxtapose the story of Hamid's book into our own personal lives is also something which I wanted to do. <clears throat> so let's see. So um, I'm going to speak on wars, conflicts, and the world of refuge and global displacement through the eyes of this particular book, Exit West. Who is a refugee? <laughs> Under the UN 1951 Convention, a refugee is defined as someone who has left their country due to a well-founded fear of being prosecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. A lot of people think a refugee is someone who has no skills, yet today afternoon, evening, you are enjoying a wonderful menu made by some of our friends who have left their nations. I live in exile myself, and my brain is not dead. Refugees can also contribute to anywhere, because no one leaves a country or your own home who doesn't love one's own home, the soil you grow up the smell of your uh, grandfather's or your grandmother's house, who doesn't like to be rooted to your soil of your birth? Interestingly, 88% um, of the refugees who leave their nations wants to go back. So when you hear rhetorics by politicians whose heart is just about vote banks to divide people, you please choose not to believe them, because facts stay otherwise. These are images of the latest refugee movement from Myanmar, which is very close to my home area, Manipur, where I come from. In today's world, as I said, ever since the World War II, we have the second highest displacement rate in the world because of a multitude of wars and conflicts. And you may ask, why so many wars and conflicts? And Mahatma Gandhi would say that there's enough for everyone's need, but for not everyone's greed. It's greed which makes these wars. It is greed which has made refugees out of people's lives. Some powerful people out there control our lives. As a result, 66 million people are currently displaced either within their home countries or abroad. And if you think that you're going to build a million walls to stop them from coming, 86% of refugees remain in developing worlds. Look at this. 
and not in wealthy regions of the world, such as Europe. And refugees account for just 0.3% of the world's population. So the question is not the numbers. The question is how do we allot resources for them and how do we ensure policies are framed so that we remain inclusive, diverse communities with an open heart where no human being is illegal. How can our bodies, our souls be illegal? Oh, um, World Refugee Day was just a few days ago. Um, I was in New York City and there was massive uh, rallies where we had badges, we call called refugees welcome, refugees. Jesus was a refugee was one of the play cards I saw. I, Albert Einstein was a refugee, <laughs> by the way. So we, I saw all these play cards, it was really wonderful. And World Refugee Day was just a couple of days back, as I mentioned. Um, this isn't the hometown where I left. It looks like Connecticut. I am also from the northeast of India. This is my homeland. I've come to USA in May because of threats I've received for our human rights work in the state of Manipur. I was doing well in my community. 15 years, I wanted to be a physicist, but dedicated my life when I saw that I was living in a war zone. You may think of India as a land which is democratic. India, the land which gave yoga to the world. But in my part of India, we have South Asia's longest running conflict. My presence here also shows that many conflicts in the world you will not even read in New York Times or be reported in BBC or CNN or any of this news. I'm a living proof that people who live in exile or seek refuge to can enrich the lives of others, other nations. And we are thankful for the shelter, love, care that you have given us too. Just to give a context of the kind of people that I come from and, and I quickly, just to let you know that people who have left as is explained in Hamid's book, when Nadia and Sa Said was leaving their home country through multiple doors to escape the war in their country. Here I'm juxtaposing position of images that I have in my personal file about the conflict which is happening right now in our own worlds. These are students from my state who are protesting the killing of a 31-year-old woman called Manorama Devi. A student is being manhandled by our, our armed forces personnel wielding heavy weaponry. This is the world that we are living in. It's not just about fictitious imagination in novels. It's happening right now. So, um, as many of us have reiterated, Mohsin's uh, Hamid's book draws home what I really liked is the initial first few chapters are quite sleazy, actually. <laughs> it talks about two people, young people, getting attracted to each other, you know, the mole on her, <laughs> you know. Um, they're getting attracted to each other, starting to date in very difficult circumstances, but done in a very breezy, beautiful way. And I'm like, all right. This is a South Asian man writing about, because in South Asia, we have a very rigid culture. We, don't, we are not supposed to have sex before marriage. <laughs> my mother met my father on the, her wedding day. <laughs> there are so many arranged marriages. <laughs> if you're living in Groton, you have to marry and someone from Groton only. <laughs> Indian society or South Asian society is divided into caste system where you are supposed to be marrying only person of your own caste. A human being is not a human being in our part of Asia where Hamid and me come from. Not to talk about the divides on class, how rich you are, the richer than you marry another rich. You have the class wars, you have the caste wars, you have the regional wars. So in that context, um, uh, how to juxtapose, so, uh, so again, it starts with two young people falling in love and he describing uh, the epitome of, a, of, of an empowered woman riding a bullet rather than a black burqa. You know, as a South Asian woman reading this book, I could understand this is exactly talking about Lahore. <laughs> so I could vision because I have friends and I'm there. One of the 
am amazing uh, things that he wrote is, he writes, in a city swollen by refugees in the book. And it's interesting because Hamid lives in, as I said, in, in Lahore. He was born in Lahore and lives in multiple places. But then Lahore of Pakistan was a time when during the Cold War and later with the Afghan war, uh, with the Soviet invasion, we, we had about four million Afghan refugees in Pakistan. <laughs> and many of them even filtered to India. So I met many Afghan refugees myself too. The UN reported as early as last year that there are still 1.3 million registered Afghan citizens still remaining in Pakistan, even today. So I think for Hamid, when he was building the context of this book, he, that's why he wrote, in a city swollen by refugees. These are images of Afghan women refugees in Pakistan. Another excerpt from the book. War would only erode the facade of their building as though it had accelerated time itself. A day's toll outpace, outpacing that of a decade. When suddenly you find the Bamiyan statues being bombed, century old structures, because in war times, the people who invade a nation, they attack cultural places. They want to destroy them. Your cultural architecture, your books, your manuscript, which gives you the identity of and pride as a community, as a group of people, as a nation, or just people. So um, in all these wars, they will attack many of these places of artistic importance. And it has happened in my own state of Manipur, where many of the cultural sites became sites for the military barracks. Imagery of war, as Hamid described in the book Exit West, cinemas and bookshops, restaurants and cafe has vanished from the city. And I particularly highlighted this because again, the places where I have come from are cinema halls. We cannot go to a cinema hall because the military has occupied those. Our schools have been occupied. For me, when I see uh, the beautiful cafe in Mystic, and when my mother asked me, how is America? I said, mom, it feels like heaven. It's beautiful and it's fair. But in our parts of the world, here's an image in Kashmir, in India, where you see the military, is, it's, you can see nothing is open. Our lives are like this. Same thing in Manipur where I am, we have a thing called curfew, where after four o'clock, nothing moves on the streets. You cannot be on the streets, otherwise you can be shot at sight orders. And this is what Hamid has described in his book too. What is also really beautiful, like as she described uh, Sai, uh, Nadia as a, a woman who drives a bike and who doesn't pray and who lives alone. Um, of wars and impact of women portrayed in the book through Nadia's character, I thought it was, was beautiful. Um, as it is written, the art in Nadia's childhood home consists of religious verses and photos of holy sites. Framed and mounted on walls, Nadia's mother and sister were quiet women. <laughs> so it's very interesting. I belong to a second generation educated woman. My mother was a first generation educated. Um, a woman who asks a question, a lot of questions, is not a good woman. <laughs> So I was never a good woman in India. <laughs> you know? So you see, quiet. As a woman, you have to be quiet. Don't ask questions was what. So it was interesting. Nadia's constant questioning and growing irrelevance in matters of faith upset and frightened her father. <laughs> Hamid writes. These are images of Afghan girls, again, refugee girls. She learned how to dress for self-protection, how best to deal with aggressive men and with police. If you get into a public transport in Lahore or Delhi, as a woman, be sure to be groped. I've been groped multiple times. I used to cry earlier, then till one, one day I realized that I will not keep quiet. So it's, it's, it's um, uh, Asian in Asian, and very interestingly, uh, you know, we are talking about a place where 100 women, million women are missing 
even as I speak. This is a region Hamid's described. Again, in the book, it's very faint connotation, but um, we live in a region where there is honor killing, Pakistan, where Hamid comes from. So there are many layers of uh, complexities of being born just a woman in our part of Asia, which um, this book just grazes over, but in, 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 a, in, in a way. Uh, but there are deeper layers to this, which we got. <coughs> Another excerpt from the book. So once, so they were living this life and then the war started commencing stronger. And then this was written, after the assault on the stock exchange of Said and Nadia city, it seemed the militants changed strategy and continued taking over and holding territory, sometimes a building, sometimes a neighborhood. Uh, so this, again, and I'm juxtaposing it from an, a real image from my home territory in Manipur. These are not military people of the Indian Armed Forces. Th these are militant groups with heavy, sophisticated weaponry. And so we pay two kinds of taxes. Taxes to the Indian government, taxes to the non-state armed groups. If you don't, you are shot. So again, as I said, our newspapers, our radio stations report some wars, but there are so many forgotten war zones across the world, which we don't know of. And this is something that I'm trying to do through Connecticut College to sort of document some of these undocumented conflicts and struggles, which you would never hear. So when Hamid writes about this, he's absolutely right of how our lives are controlled not just by government forces, but also by non-state armed groups. And at least for the government, you can go to the Human Rights Committee or the UN, but when a non-state armed group commit a crime, where do you go? <laughs> so there are so many sexual assaults committed by armed groups which you can't even try to get justice. As the conflict, uh, sort of uh, as Nadia and Said was at the time of their fleeing, he talks about curfew has been imposed, send back checkpoints, razor wire, proliferating howitzers, infantry fighting vehicles and tanks. He describes a warlike situation. Then one day, the signal to every mobile phone in the city simply vanished. An announcement of the government's decision was made over television and radio, a temporary anti-terrorism measure, it was said, but with no end date given. Internet connectivity was suspended at. This is very real. Many a times in Kashmir or in Manipur, our phone lines, our internet is just cut off. Again, uh, one of the steps that I saw, again, images of Indian armed forces operating. People vanish for days. And for most part, one never knew at least for a while if they are dead or alive. Deprived of the portals to each other and to the world provided by the mobile phones and confirmed to, confined to the apartments by the night time curfew, Nadia and Said and countless others felt maroon and alone and much more afraid. I juxtapose the writing in the book with an image from my own region in Manipur, where armed force personnel are handling civilians. So many lives have been lost in many of these conflicts around our worlds. Now, what is very interesting, which I want to juxtapose, is while Nadi, Saad, uh, Sai, uh, you, know, na, uh, you know, the two protagonists left through uh, the, the imagery of the door, which opens, you know, it's, it's very one of the most amazing imageries of the book is about where Nadia and Said was able to go through multiple doors to find their peace finally. But what about million others who have not been able to leave? And here I bring in the story of some of the forgotten parts of the world where our mothers, our grandmothers, started patrolling the streets at night with bamboo torches to claim their sense of peace. So while many fled, like the protagonists of the Neville did, 
Many who cannot flee because they don't have passports. They don't know where to even apply for them. <laughs> they continue to live their life, innovating ways to find their peace and their sanity. So these are some images of how women in our part of the world resist the violence, the militarization, and the continued repression of our lives in this region by both state and non-state. This is a very famous picture which you must have seen of migrants in the Mediterranean, of an overcrowded boat. Many have seized, seized this, this, and many have died in the waters. And uh, <clears throat> what is interesting is what Hamid writes, when we migrate, once relationship to windows now changed in the city. A window was the border through which death was possibili a possibility most likely to come. I cringe when I read these words on page 98. When we migrate, we murder from our lives those who live behind. I beg to differ from Hamid there. I left my eight-year-old daughter when I came here. But through technology, I keep in touch every day. To this morning, I just taught mathematics through Skype. <laughs> we don't murder those who live behind. In fact, when you leave your home and your loved ones behind, it binds you more in, in ways that you never imagined. That in one of my r r diaries I wrote, it is in the darkest times that you see the brightest light. But what Hamid actually writes later is, which I like, and like the one in blue, is, and the passage was both like dying and like being born. So when I came to Connecticut College <laughs> this year, I never heard of Connecticut College before. <laughs> because it's only about Columbia and Yale and <laughs> Harvard and Stanford. And I was, why here? Why am I brought here? But once I entered the campus, the peace, uh, the warmth of the colleagues, um, the library, the activities, um, sort of brought calm and I was able to write again. That I'm presently completing two books simultaneously. <laughs> um, and I felt, reborn again. So I end with the last few writings. As she entered the black lanes in a gasping struggle as she fought to exit, Nadia fell cold and bruised and damned as she lay on the floor of the room at the other side. In this group, everyone was foreign. And so in a sense, no one was. The camp was in some ways like a trading post in an old time gold rush. And I'm reading out the first few, uh, last few uh, lines and I'll end with that. So later, Nadia and Said comes to United States, I think. <laughs> they come to a place called Marine, if I'm pronouncing correctly. And there he writes, in Marin, am I pronouncing it right? Marin, Marin. Marin. all right. <laughs> Is it a real place called Marin? Yes. All right, <laughs> all right. So in Marin, there were, no, there were almost no natives. These people have died or driven out of exterminated long ago. And one would see them occasionally at in impromptu trading posts, perhaps more often, but wrapped in clothes and guises around behaviors indistinguishable from anyone else. Tales were told at these places that people from all over now gathered to hear for the tales of the natives felt appropriate to this time of migration. And yet, it was not quite true to say there were almost no natives, nativeness being a relative matter. And many others considered themselves natives to this country by which they meant they or their parents, or their grandparents, or their great-grandparents of their grandparents had been born in that strip of land. And that their existence here did not owe anything to a physical migration 
that has occurred in their lifetime. People bought and sold houses the way they bought and sold stocks. And every year, someone was moving out and someone was moving in. And now all these doors from who knows where were opening and all sorts of strange people were around. People who looked more at home than she was. Even the homeless ones who spoke no English more at home, maybe, because they were younger. And when she went out, it seemed to her that she too had migrated, that everyone migrates. Even if we stay in the same houses or whole lives, because we can't help it. All over the world, people were slipping away from where they had been. From one fertile plains, from seaside villages, from overcrowded cities and murderous battlefields, and slipping away from other people too. We, we are all migrants through time. So any question, please? It would be wonderful if you could say your name. Are they completely safe since there, is, yeah. there are definitely people that would like to bring you harm? Yes. So right now, there are 13 security people guarding my parental home and my daughter. Because um, of the threat, um, before I came, I filed what is known as protection plea in the Supreme Court of India. And because of that, the Supreme Court of India provided security. So I have been given police protection for life because of the work that I do. And the work that I do is not about secession. It's all about <laughs> ensuring that we follow the democratic principles of our own country, India, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's all we do, in and out, for 15 long years. But because some of the people who commit gun violence are, the, uh, are politicians who are ruling India, they feel that we who are trying to do the right thing are a threat to the existence. So as a result, no. They are not safe, but there's no other choice right now, but just to stay brave and continue this work, and we will do it. All refugees are immigrants, but not all immigrants are refugees. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's not only our Twitter in chief who doesn't mm -hmm. seem to understand that. Yes. It seems to be yes. um, a confusion yes. that is rampant in this country. Yes. That is, Thank you for yes. making that distinction right at the beginning yes. and giving us a definition yes. of a refugee. I think it's an important one to remember. Yes, yes. Sometimes we have to go back to remember humanity. That people who have an ax to grind, they call it in English, they do it all the time. They will make the refugee look like, as I said, only 88% of the world's refugees are in developing world. Not here, not even in Europe. All the images in the press is always about these huge boats. Right now, the seven million refugees uh, which are coming out from um, uh, Myanmar right now is being housed uh, in uh, Bangladesh, in Manipur where I am from, and even in different parts of Pakistan and, uh, and, and Malaysia and Indonesia. So it's very important that we go beyond the rhetorics of um, Twitter's in chief, <laughs> and many others. Um, that's why it's very important for citizens, which we call, I use a, 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 a word called citizen's vigil, <laughs> to remain alert so that we are rooted uh, to know the truth and stand by it. Um, because it's a world of propaganda that we live in now. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting, even Indian Prime Minister Modi, his Twitter handle is handled by people who are Harvard Law School. Harvard grads. His whole social media campaign is handled by graduates from Harvard. So very smart. But you tell the truth. But if you're telling a lie, it's not good. So, uh, and what for, you see? So, uh, as again, I go back to what Mahatma Gandhi said, we have everything for everyone's needs for this in this earth, but for not for everyone's greed. So it's that greed we are fighting against, yeah. What is the primary conflict that dominates in your home? Right? Yes, yeah. So um, 
you know that uh, India was a nation which was formed only in 1947. Before that, India was, there was no India. The British actually brought everyone under the term British India. And as they left in 1947, so Manipur was like a nation state like Bhutan is. It was an independent nation state with a 3,000 year old recorded history. We wrote our own constitution even before India wrote its own constitution. But it's all right. We are now, we believe in a globalized world where it's not about small, small, tiny states. Look at Europe now, you know. With one visa you can go to, with one Schengen visa you can travel 29 different countries in Europe with just one visa. So I truly believe in an integrated world, but not uh, saying that my culture is better than yours, my religion is better than yours. So right now the struggle is about the fact that yes, the people in Manipur are now a part of the Indian nation state, but for more than 70 years since its inclusion, our history is not in Indian textbooks. And we have, if you think India is a land which gave yoga and it gives you peace and spiritualism, <laughs> in my part of India we have, India imposed a martial law in 1958 and it still exists. It's called the Armed Forces Special Powers Act of 1958, under this act, anyone could be shot, arrested, tortured, killed, or raped at mere charges of suspicion. You don't even have to go, and we can't even go to court because the Indian Defense Ministry and the Home Ministry defends anyone to file a case against a military. And you will not hear about this because when you come to India, even with an Indian visa, you were not allowed in our territories. And, but for us, it's important, we want India to be a pristine example of a fine democracy. All we are asking is India, please remove the martial law, treat us as equal citizens of an equal country. We face racism there. Because, you know, this face, even in Delhi, many times people ask, Madam, which country are you from? An Indian is asking me, <laughs> which country I am from? It hurts. So, uh, you know, so that's why this book that I'm working on, Gender and Race Relations, is about, it's because not everything can be done with a protest march. A lot of it, it has to be done with a logic, with uh, an understanding to let even those policymakers understand. And it has to be done with a lot of love. So that's what we are doing right now. So it's about fighting militarization of our lives, it's about ensuring that our history is in the textbooks of this country, of, I mean, India as such. And we're asking for um, uh, peace talks so that, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that there is peace back and so that development could kick in and then we are able to um, just live a normal life. That's it, yeah. And I want to say thank you very much for all the work you're doing. It's incredible. You are remarkable. <laughs> June 20th of 2018 in New York Times, there was a piece written on um, what's going on in India when it comes to the water crisis um, in New Delhi. And um, I think one of the towns was Shaimala. I, I don't, it's, a, it's another municipality and how they went seven to eight days without water because there's a council that controls the water system. Um, and I know based on tourism and everything else that affects that those, those particular municipalities. If you can just, do you think um, because of what's going on, the threat of water within those areas, um, do you think that's going to create, um, make people want to just flee and, and leave the area who have the power and the ability to leave? And um, how is that going to change that, that particular area if it, if it does occur? Um, because their money comes in is based on tourism. And, that, you know, and if you could just expand on that a little bit. And also, um, the second question I have is, when you look at British rule, mm -hmm. and when the British came in, you talked about racism and everything. And I know the number one selling product in the world is um, skin bleaching cream. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if you can um, talk a little bit about how that's playing a role in affecting um, people adjusting to um, 
wanting to be something, the self-identity, the self-hate yes. that exists within um, your culture as well. Absolutely. Before I came uh, uh, here to United States, we were leading a very critical campaign called Diversity Now campaign in India. This started after two things. A lot of our young people from this Indo, Indo, in this northeast of India, because our face are more Tibeto Mongoloid. So uh, a lot of, there were 870 plus cases of racial attacks against young people from our region because we look more Thai, Filipino, and less Indian. So we actually engaged the government of India to form a national diversity policy and prevail upon the government to form what is known as a diversity, uh, an anti-racial law because many young women from our indigenous territories were murdered in Delhi in their rented apartments because uh, the kind of imagery they gave in the rest of India towards our people is the, our women are morally loose, they don't have brains, they, they're not intelligent enough, so everything negative. Uh, we have a rich culture and folk tales and everything, but yet uh, our culture is always inferior. So we, we really launch a campaign. That's one. The other form of racism that we are facing in India is also about color. So in India, that a typical beautiful woman is fair. <laughs> so it's like we have creams called fair and lovely. Seriously. And in this, it's fair. I hope one day I can play those advertisements. It's really funny. So a girl is dark. And then she's using this fair and lovely cream. And in seven days, her skin is getting softer and whiter and then after seven months uh, seven days then she gets a dream job because she's fairer and she gets married to the men of our dreams <laughs> so if you type fair and lovely indian creams on youtube please if you want to have a good laugh please see that <laughs> so absolutely racism is not just about um, the skin color it's also when one ethnic group the other so we are looking at different types of racism which exist in our cultures one indigenous community doing the, uh, the other. You know, so it's racism is in our, in our minds. And this is something that's why the work, book that I'm working on is absolutely critical. I'm collaborating with American scholars as well as from Amherst, as well as a New School, as well as scholars from around the country because <laughs> India with 1.3 billion people doesn't have an, a diversity policy, can you imagine? So that's a work that as, and, and I think even here in this country, what professors told me is the whole issue of race relations discussion stopped in the 80s. And it's not being taken up. So it's, it's something which this country also needs to look into. And your question about water, yes, it's all about the control of resources. Who controls whom? It's a greed, again, as I talked to you, whether it's water, whether it's land, whether it's um, all of this that we got to confront together. And uh, yeah, they say that uh, right now, India and Pakistan, I mean, Hamid's Pakistan and India, where I come from, they're into this, what is known as water wars. The next war is going to be on war on water as extremely important natural resource. So yes, we got to, yeah. But that will be another whole uh, uh, lecture altogether. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Napram. I think we could have gone on all night because we can read the book, but um, hearing it first person is, is really powerful. So I'm sure uh, Bina will stay around afterwards if uh, people have questions that we can continue the conversation. Um, so please check your calendar of events, uh, our calendar of events often. We've planned some exciting programs and we hope you'll join us at the book discussions around the region uh, to share your insights about we Exit West. Um, books are available tonight for purchase uh, thanks to another one of our longtime partners, Bank Square Books. Um, we hope you enjoy the book, the library programs, and the book discussions over the summer months. And we'll see you on September 26th at Connecticut College, um, where we hope you'll bring your friends and your neighbors and everyone you know to meet Mosin Hamid. And please, don't forget, we want you to come enjoy some great food.